Hello Year 5s, uh, this is your Wednesday, yes, Wednesday activity for this week for your home learning and it's to sit back and enjoy the story of Macbeth. Uh, most of you uh, were there at school when we read this, whether it was me or Mr Lawson or Mr Moody, you would have already read this, um, but that seems like ages ago and there were some of you that weren't there. So I think we all need a recap, even if we understood it really well at the time. Plus, it's a really, really good story. So get yourself comfy, get yourself a drink, maybe a snack, maybe some biscuits, um, and enjoy it. So, Macbeth, written by William Shakespeare. Hopefully this week you've already done some research about Shakespeare and reminded yourself, or maybe you learnt some new things about him. Um, full... Um, disclosure, my accents aren't very good, not my forte, but um, Macbeth is set in Scotland. My class, we all fully committed to reading Macbeth in a Scottish accent when we read it in class. Um, be nice. No um, trolling for my dodgy Scottish accent, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it starts with a quote, actually, which is a really famous quote from the original story of Macbeth. So obviously Macbeth was written as a play um, by Shakespeare. This is a story version of it. We didn't talk about that when we did it at school. It's a story version of the play. But it starts by a um, famous quote from the witches from the uh, original Shakespeare version, which is, when shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. So that's just a nice quote at the start. So, um, let's begin. All day, the three witches waited on the edge of the battlefield. Hidden by mist and magic, they watched the Scottish army win a victory over the invading forces of Norway. And after the fight was done, they lingered on, gloating over the moans of the dying. So remember, there'd been a, there was a big war, a big battle between Scotland and Norway, and Scotland won. As thunder rolled overhead and rain lashed down, one of the witches raised her long, hooked nose to the wind and sniffed like a dog taking a scent. <laughs> he will be here soon, she said. The second witch stroked the tuft of silvery hair that sprouted from her chin and grinned, showing her gums. I hear the sound of hooves, sisters, she said. The third witch held up a piece of rock crystal in front of her milky blind eyes. Inside the crystal, something seemed to move. I see him, she screeched. He comes, let the spell begin. Two Scottish generals rode slowly away from the battlefield, their heads lowered against the driving rain. One was Macbeth, the Thane of Glamis, the bravest soldier in King Duncan's army. He was tall, broad-shouldered and had a warrior's face, broken nose and scarred from old fights. His companion and friend, Banquo, was younger and slimmer, with a mouth that was quick to smile although he wasn't smiling now. Macbeth's dark eyes were distant as he recalled the details of the day's slaughter. A hard fight to protect an old feeble king, he thought. If I ruled Scotland... His mind drifted off into a familiar daydream. He saw himself seated on the throne with the golden crown of Scotland circling his brow. So Macbeth's got this dream, hasn't he, that he wants to be king of Scotland. Um, he hasn't said anything, it's just a dream that keeps popping into his head. Suddenly, his horse reared and whinnied, its eyes rolling in terror. Macbeth struggled to control the horse, and at that moment a bolt of lightning turned the air violet. In the eerie light, he saw three weird hags barring the way their wild hair and ragged robes streaming like tattered flags in the wind. Macbeth's hand flew to his sword, but Banquo hissed out an urgent warning. No, my friend, I do not think swords can harm creatures like these. 
A small cold fear entered Macbeth's heart and he snarled to conceal it. What do you want? he demanded of the witches. Stand aside! Moving as one, the witches raised their left arms and pointed crooked fingers at Macbeth. They spoke and their voices grated like iron on stone. All hail Macbeth, Thane of Glamis! All hail Macbeth, Thane of Cawdor! All hail Macbeth, who shall be king! Macbeth gave a startled gasp. How had these withered crones come to read his secret thoughts? The witches turned their fingers to Banquo. All hail Banquo, they chanted. Your children shall be kings. And they vanished like a mist of breath on a mirror. So what they're doing there, what they were saying was all hail, that means all worship, Macbeth, Thane of Glamis. He's already Thane of Glamis. That's a little bit like... Um, sort of being a lord of a, of a part of, of a country. So he's already Thane of Glamis, as his title. They then said, all hail Macbeth, Thane of Cawdor. He's not Thane of Cawdor, somebody else is Thane of Cawdor at the moment. And then, all hail Macbeth, who shall be king. Obviously, he's not king, there already is a king. And then, all hail Banquo, your children shall be kings, they said. Were they ghosts? Banquo whispered in amazement. They were mad women, snorted Macbeth. How can I be fain of Cawdor? He is alive and well, and one of King Duncan's most trusted friends. And how could my children be kings if you took the throne? Banquo asked. So what they mean there is, um, obviously at the moment King Duncan's king, and um, the throne is hereditary. So after King Duncan, King Duncan's children will be kings, and so on. So even if Macbeth were to be king, Banquo's children could never be kings because it's passed down in the family. The sound of hoofbeats made both men turn their heads. Out of the rain appeared a royal herald. He pulled his horse to a halt and lifted a hand in salute. I bring great news, he announced. The Thane of Cawdor has confessed to treason and has been executed. The king has given his title and lands to you, noble Macbeth. He has proclaimed you as his heir after his sons Malcolm and Donalbane. All hail Macbeth, Thane of Glamis and Cawdor. So something the witches have said has already come true. The Thane of Cawdor's confessed to treason. That means like plotting against the king or something. And has been killed. And the king has said not only... Is Macbeth now the Thane of Cawdor, but also he will be heir to the throne after the king's sons. So back then, um, this is set in the 1500s, I think, before Shakespeare's time, um, you, the king would have the power to just choose um, somebody to take over the throne so he's said obviously his sons will take over the throne after him but then Macbeth can have it. Macbeth's face turned deathly pale. So the witches told the truth he thought. Only Duncan and his sons stand between me and the crown. My wife must know of this. I will write to her tonight. Macbeth was so deep in thought that he didn't notice the troubled look that Banquo gave him. The witches had left a scent of evil in the air and Banquo seemed to smell it, clinging to his friend. Lady Macbeth stood at the window of her bedchamber, gazing out at the clouds gathering above the turrets of Glamis Castle. In her right hand, she held the letter from her husband and its words echoed through her mind. Glamis, Cawdor, King, you could have them all, she whispered. But I know you too well, my lord. You want greatness, but you shrink from what you must do to get it. If only. So Lady Macbeth, Macbeth's wife, uh, is obviously thinking, oh, it'd be great if he could be king. Um, but she doesn't think that he will uh, do anything to get that. There was a knock at the door. Lady Macbeth started and turned, her long black hair whispering against the green silk of her gown. 
Come, she called. A servant entered. A message from Lord Macbeth, my lady, he said. He bids you prepare a royal banquet, for the king will stay at Glamis tomorrow night. What? Lady Macbeth gasped in amazement. Are you mad? She quickly recovered herself. Go and tell the other servants to make ready for the king, she commanded. When she was alone again, Lady Macbeth opened the window and a blast of cold air caught her face and swirled it about her face, caught her hair and swirled it about her face. Fate leads Duncan to Glamis, she murmured. Come to me, powers of darkness, fill me with cruelty so I may teach my husband how to be ruthless. A low growl of thunder answered her. So the king is coming to stay at their house. Wonder what Lady Macbeth was thinking at this point. Macbeth rode ahead of the king's party and arrived at Glamis just after sunrise. When his wife greeted him, he noticed a hard, determined look in her eyes. The king sleeps here tonight, he said. Is his room ready? All is ready for Duncan's last night on earth, said Lady Macbeth. What do you mean? Macbeth asked. Lady Macbeth moved closer and spoke in a low voice. I guessed the thought that lay behind your letter, she said. Duncan is old and weak. His sons are not fit to rule. But you are. Kill the king while he sleeps and let Malcolm and Donalbane bear the blame. Macbeth was astonished. First the witches, and now his wife had seen his innermost thoughts. Some strange force seemed to have taken control of his life, and he fought against it. I will never commit murder and treason, he declared. I will put a sleeping potion in the jug of wine and send it to the guards at the king's door, Lady Macbeth said quickly. They will sleep like babes. It will be easy for you to slip into Duncan's room. No, I cannot, Macbeth groaned. Lady Macbeth's face twisted into a sneer. This is your real chance to be king, she said. Are you too cowardly to take it? I am no coward, snapped Macbeth. Then prove it, Lady Macbeth hissed. Kill the old man and take the throne. Once more, the strange force moved through Macbeth flowing into him from his wife until he was unable to resist. All hail Macbeth who shall be king, he thought, and he could almost feel the crown upon his head. Long after the castle had fallen silent, Macbeth left his room and crept along the corridors. His hands trembled and the sound of his pulse in his ears was like the beating of a battle drum. This is the hour of the wolf and the witch, he thought, when evil spirits roam the night. And as the words crossed his mind, a ghostly glow gathered in the darkness, shaping itself into a dagger that floated in the air, shining with a sickly green light. Macbeth almost cried out in terror. Be calm, he told himself. This is a trick of the mind. To prove it, he reached out his hand to take the dagger, but it floated away from him and pointed the way to Duncan's door. Blood began to ooze from the blade, as though the iron were weeping red tears. A bell tolled midnight. Duncan's funeral bell is ringing, muttered Macbeth, and he followed the dagger through the gloom. Lady Macbeth also heard the bell toll, and it seemed a long time before her husband returned. There was blood on his face and hands, and he carried two daggers. You should not have brought the daggers here, said Lady Macbeth. Go back and put them into the guard's hands as we planned. Macbeth's eyes were blank. He shook his head. I will not go back there, he said hoarsely. Then I will, said Lady Macbeth, and snatched the daggers from Macbeth's hands and left the room. Macbeth stood where he was, shivering uncontrollably, seeing nothing but Duncan's dead eyes staring. He tried to pray, but his lips and tongue would not form the words. In a short while, Lady Macbeth came back, holding her red hands up to the candlelight. 
I smeared blood over the guards' faces to make them seem guilty, she said. In the morning, we will have them tortured until they say that Duncan's sons paid them to kill him. Her face was so full of triumph and cruelty that Macbeth no longer recognised it. He turned away and caught sight of his reflection in the mirror. It was as if he were looking at someone else, as if he and his wife had become strangers to themselves and each other. Glamis Castle was woken in the grey light of dawn by voices shouting, Murder! The king is slain! Shocked guests ran from their rooms and spoke in whispers. Who could have murdered the king? Rumours flew through the castle like swallows, and suspicion fell on Malcolm and Donalbane, who had the most to gain from their father's death. So people would automatically assume that it was Malcolm and Donalbane, because... Um, Obviously, it would mean that they were then king, so they would have the most to gain from it. Malcolm and Donalbane were convinced that Macbeth was the murderer, but they would not dare accuse him. Who would believe that the hero of the battle against the Norwegians would slay his own king? Though they knew it would be taken as proof of their guilt, Duncan's sons fled for their lives. Donalbane sailed for Ireland and Malcolm rode across the border into England to put himself under the protection of the English king. Now nothing stood between Macbeth and the throne. He was crowned, but the crown did not bring him the pleasure he had imagined. His secret dream had come true, but he was disturbed by other dreams, dreams of what the witches had foretold for Banquo's descendants. So, What's happened is Malcolm and Donald Bain knew that nobody would believe them if they said it was Macbeth, so they've run away. So Macbeth's become the king because the king said that after his sons, Macbeth could be king. But he's really worried still. He can't stop thinking about what the witches said about Banquo. So the witches said that Macbeth would be Thane of Glamis, which he already was, that he would be Thane of Cawdor, which he was then straight away afterwards, that he would be king, which he is now, but the witches also said that Banquo's son would be king. So Macbeth's really worrying about that and he's thinking, what if the other things that the witches said also came true? What if this happens next? Have I lied and murdered to set Banquo's spawn on the throne? He brooded. I must find a way to rid myself of him and his son. A dark plan formed in Macbeth's mind and he kept it a secret, even from Lady Macbeth. Without either of them realising, the strange force that had compelled them to kill Duncan was slowly driving them apart. What do you think his plan's going to be? What do you think he's going to do? Macbeth held a coronation feast in the royal castle at Dunsinan. Many of the nobles who attended remarked that Macbeth's old friend, Banquo, was not present, but Macbeth laughed when they mentioned it. Lord Banquo and his son must have been delayed on their way, he said lightly. Only he knew what had delayed them, for he had hired two murderers to ambush them on the road. At the height of the feast, a servant brought Macbeth a message that two men wished to see him on urgent business. Macbeth hurried to his private chambers and he found the murderers waiting there. Have you done what I paid you to do? Macbeth demanded. Banquo is dead, my lord, one of the murderers said. We cut his throat and threw the body into a ditch. Macbeth sighed with relief. Perhaps now he would sleep peacefully. But then he sensed something wrong. Neither of the murderers would look at him, and they kept anxiously shuffling their feet. And his son, said Macbeth. The reply was shattering. He escaped, my lord. Banquo's son still lives. As he returned to the banqueting hall, doubts tortured Macbeth like scorpion stings. Banquo's son still lives, he thought, lives to take his revenge on me, to claim the throne and father sons who will rule after him. Is there no end to the blood that must be shed before I find peace? As he entered the hall, Macbeth put on a false smile to hide his troubled mind, but the smile froze when he saw a hooded figure seated in his chair. Who dares sit in my place? he roared. The guests fell silent and looked bewildered. The king's chair was empty. Why, no one, my lord, 
said Lady Macbeth with a forced laugh. She could see that something was wrong with her husband, but she could not guess what. The king is jesting, she told the nobles. This is no jest, marked Mac barked Macbeth. He strode angrily towards the figure, then recoiled in horror as it drew back its hood. So he's seeing things, isn't he, basically? There's nobody sitting in his seat, but he's walked into the room and can see someone sat there. Lady Macbeth's trying to cover it up. For what he saw was Banquo, with weed tangled in his hair and mud streaked across his face, with a deep gash in his neck that sent a stream of blood pattering onto the flagstones and haunting glassy eyes that stared and stared. Get rid of him! Macbeth screeched. The nobles sprang to their feet, drawing their daggers, knocking over chairs and wine cups in the confusion. Back to your grave, sobbed Macbeth. Banquo smiled. There was blood in his mouth and his teeth shone white through it. Then he faded into the shadows and the torchlight. So everyone's going to be thinking, what on earth is going on and what's wrong with Macbeth? The guards are there with their swords like... I don't know what we're meant to be doing here because there's nobody there in Macbeth's seat, but Macbeth's staring at this person saying, get rid of him, but there's nobody there. My lords, the king is ill, Lady Macbeth said desperately. Leave us now, let him rest. In the morning, he'll be himself again. Myself, Macbeth moaned softly to himself. I will not be myself again until Banquo's spirit is laid to rest. Only the witches can set me free. The witches were seated in a huddle around a fire, over which a cauldron bubbled. In the sky above their heads, a full moon sailed, casting silver light over the battlefield, still littered with unburied corpses. The blind witch held up her crystal. Deep inside, a tiny horse and rider galloped wildly through the night. He comes, she cackled. The spell is still strong. And Macbeth came out of the moonlight his horse's flanks white with lathered sweat. He, clam he climbed up from the saddle and was about to speak when the hook-nosed witch, ca witch called out, The king wishes to know the future. It is not for the faint-hearted, warned the bearded witch. I have courage enough, Macbeth growled. The blind witch dipped a wooden cup into the cauldron and held it out. Drink, she said. Macbeth took the cup and lifted it to his lips, shuddering as he swallowed. Fire and ice and the light of the moon burned in his brain. The blind witch's face melted like the edge of a cloud and became the face of Duncan, his silver hair dark with blood. Beware, Macduff, the Thane of Fife, Duncan said, and then he changed into Banquo. No man born of a woman can harm you, Banquo said. You will rule until Burnham Woods walks to Dunsinan. Then I am safe, cried Macbeth. No one can stop me. And he was alone. The witches, their cauldron and the fire had vanished. So if you can remember this bit, what the witches have said now is that he needs to beware Macduff, who we haven't met yet, and also that no man born from a woman can harm you. And also that Macbeth will be fine, he'll be safe, until Burnham Woods, like a forest, walks to Dunsinan, which is where he lives. So Macbeth's thinking, oh, finally, I can sleep easy because every person is born from a woman. So no man can ever harm me. And also, it's not possible for a woods to walk to the castle. That's not a thing. That can't be real. So I'm going to be fine. The only thing he does need to think about is this person called Macduff. So it was the start of a fearful time. On his return to Dunsinan, Macbeth ordered that Macduff be arrested. When he heard that Macduff had fled to England to join Malcolm, that's the king's original son, Malcolm, Macbeth had Macduff's castle burned and his wife and children put to death. From then on, anyone who questioned the king's commands no matter how harsh or unjust those commands might be, was executed. The gap between Macbeth and his wife grew wider. The guilty secret of Duncan's murder gnawed at Lady Macbeth's mind like a maggot inside an apple. She fell ill and began to walk in her sleep, dreaming that she and Macbeth were still covered with Duncan's blood. Out, damn stain, she croaked, 
Will nothing make me clean? Doctors could do nothing for her and she grew weaker every day. So she's gone mad basically, hasn't she? With the guilt and the um, thoughts of the king and everybody being killed. Then at last hope came to Macbeth's suffering subjects. Malcolm had raised an army in England and with Macduff at his side, he marched his troops into Scotland. There, the army was cre greeted by cheering crowds who longed to be freed from the tyrant Macbeth. So Macbeth's turned into a horrible king. He's killing anybody that questions what he says. He's just dictating everything. Malcolm, who's the king's son who fled to England, has joined up with Macduff, the one who... So Macbeth had killed his family. He's the one that the, ki the witches have just said he needs to be aware of. They've joined together and have marched up to Scotland with an army. First, Glamis Castle was captured and burned, and then Malcolm's forces marched on to Dunsinan. To the despair of Macbeth's generals, he did nothing. Each time they advised him to go to battle, he laughed and said, I have nothing to fear until the day that Bonham Woods walks to Dunsinan. So he's so confident because of what the witches said. He's so confident that nothing can hurt him. Through the windows of the throne room, Macbeth could see the distant campfires of Malcolm's army. He raised a cup of wine to them. Fools, he jeered. You cannot overthrow me. A sound made him turn. A servant was standing at the door, wringing his hands and weeping. What is it? Macbeth asked gruffly. The queen, my lord, said the servant. She is dead. For a long time, Macbeth was silent remembering the early years of his marriage when the world had seemed bright. Life goes on day after day, but it means nothing, he said in a cracked whisper. It ends in despair and darkness and death. Macbeth did not sleep that night. He drank cup after cup of wine, but it brought him no comfort. Only the certainty that his enemies would be defeated and that he would remain unharmed gave him hope. So he still believes nobody can harm him because the witches said nobody born from a woman can hurt him and he thinks well everyone was born from a woman and he will be king until the forest the Burnham Woods walks to the castle so he's like no nope, I'll be fine at dawn an anxious faced captain brought the king strange news the enemy is approaching my lord he said to conceal the strength of their numbers they are hiding behind branches cut from Burnham Woods. It looks as though the forest is on the march. My curse upon you, witches, howled Macbeth. You deceived me. I have lost everything, but at least I can die like a soldier with a sword in my hand. Go tell the servants to bring my armour. So the forest has walked to the castle. It was a short battle. Macbeth's army had no stomach for a fight to protect a king they now hated, and the soldiers began to surrender to Malcolm's men, first in a trickle, then in a flood. Macbeth fought recklessly, as though he wished to be killed, but he hacked down opponent after opponent, shouting, You were born of a woman! And he delivered the death blow. He still thinks nobody's going to kill him. At last, Macbeth found himself alone. He was resting against a cart when he heard someone call his name. It was Macduff, striding through the smoke of battle, his broadsword at the ready. I have come to avenge my wife and children, Macduff said through clenched teeth. Stay back, warned Macbeth. I cannot be harmed by a man born from a woman. My mother died before I was born, said Macduff his eyes blazing with hate. To save me, the doctor cut me from her body. <gasps> so he wasn't technically born from a woman. Macbeth threw back his head and laughed bitterly. He saw now that all the witch's promises had been lies and that by believing them, he had betrayed himself. The force that had dominated him was gone and only his courage remained. Come then, Macduff, he cried, Make an end of me. Macduff struck off Macbeth's head with a single sweep of his sword. The head was placed on top of a spear that had been driven into the ground outside the gates at Dunsinan. The victorious army cheered, then marched away to see Malcolm crowned king. As the sun set, 
three ravens flapped down from the castle walls and fluttered around Macbeth's head. All hail, Macbeth, they called. All hail, all hail. That's the end of the story of Macbeth. Um, such a good story, isn't it? It's so exciting. Um, hopefully that was a nice recap for those of you that were at school when we read that. And if you haven't heard it before, hopefully you really enjoyed it. Um, and there's going to be some work in tomorrow's home learning and Friday's home learning. Um, and actually carrying on for the next couple of weeks in English, all based on the story of Macbeth. So I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I will hopefully hear from some of you soon and take care everybody.